Good afternoon and welcome. We're delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, and how appropriate for this panel to be introduced by the voice of God. That's pretty good. Uh, on December 17th of 2014, the world was taken by surprise with a simultaneous announcement by the presidents of the United States and Cuba that the two countries, after 50 plus years and nine US presidents, would reestablish diplomatic relations. For those of us whose lives have been affected by US-Cuba relationships and shaped by them as mine has been, it was a surreal moment. Today, we are privileged to have with us Cardinal Ortega and Ambassador De Laurentiis, who were protagonists in these events, and who not only represent faith and diplomacy, but who have demonstrated enormous faith in diplomacy as they, as they have pursued this opening. Cardinal Ortega, has hosted three papal visits in Cuba, I think unprecedented in the history of the church, certainly unprecedented in Cuba that had never had a visit from a pope. And I remember being there in the first, uh, when John Paul came to um, Cuba and in his mass he asked that Cuba open to the world and the world open to Cuba. And I think Cardinal Ortega has been trying to deliver on that ever since. Ambassador De Laurentiis, has been in Cuba, he started his uh, foreign service in Cuba and, and then came back for two more postings. This third one, of course, he has been part of history. And he both hosted uh, Sen Se uh, Secretary Kerry when he raised the American flag to the, um, having the US Marines playing the Cuban anthem uh, in an incredible ceremony, which again, I was um, privileged to be part of. And then after that, he hosted uh, President Obama's historic visit this past March. So I've been witness to the enormous impact that these two men have had on Cuba and beyond. And we're delighted to have them here today to give us a firsthand account on how all this came about, a behind the scenes look. And then we're hoping that if traffic permits, Cardinal Dolan, who many of you know as the Archbishop of New York, but also America's Archbishop, um, will be here to help us put it in a broader context. So with that, let me turn it over to Cardinal Ortega to start. Thank you, Michu. Dear Ambassador, dear friends, I gladly accepted the invitation of Concordia when I understood that it was a meeting highlighting the importance of dialogue and diplomacy and offering them as feasible and effective actions to the world of the 21st century, where so many conflicts and clashes persist, and even worsen in this first third of the century. I think it is appropriate that the subject of the diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba be included in the reflections of Concordia since it becomes a paradigm for the fundamental conciliation purpose of this organization. It was expressed as such by Pope Francis in his speech to the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See on January 12, 2015. And I quote, one example close to my heart of how dialogue can build bridges from, comes from the recent decision of the United States of America and Cuba to end a lack of communication which has endured for more than half a century and to initiate a rapprochement for the benefit of their respective citizens. The Pope did not hesitate to ask other nations involved in conflicts of all sorts to follow the example of Cuba and the US in the use of diplomacy and dialogue. I am among you precisely because of the decision of the Pope Francis to bring me in as a participant in a dialogue already initiated between Cuba and the United States. The Holy Father assigned me a specific role in the evolution of those negotiations. We are in the presence of a Latin American Pope and the conflict to be resolved involved Cuba, a part of Latin America. Its persistence damaged U.S. relations with Latin America. 
It's no wonder they're having the secret negotiations between Cuba and the U.S. on their way since 2013, arrived at a given point in their development, the government of Cuba asked the Pope to appropriate diplomatic channels and intermediation with the U.S. government in favor of improving the relations between the two countries. Moreover, in November of that year, 2013, analyst and political scientist Dr. Julia Swai visited me in Havana to communicate the desire of pro tempore president of Senate, Patrick Leahy, that Pope Francis entered the scene of a likely rapprochement between Cuba and the United States. Dr. Swai added that the reason for this was the climate toward Cuba and the White House has changed, perhaps 50%, in favor of an improvement of U.S. relations with Cuba. The concrete proposal that Senator made through Dr. Swai was a humanitarian intervention of Pope Francis addressed to Raul Castro in favor of an American prisoner, Alan Gross, and similar one addressed to President Barack Obama in favor of three Cuban prisoners in U.S. jails. She understood my difficulties in granting a desire which was well-intentioned but of difficult immediate realization. She asked me then to stay in touch with her and said that I would get something more precise at a later stage. So I read, it was through a visitor who had Dr. Swice's complete trust that I received from the United States in March 2014 a sealed envelope containing a personal letter from Senator Leahy, others said to me, written in English with an impeccable translation into Spanish. The senator, the senator expressed it in his letter, and I quote, I have spoken to President Obama and other senior U.S. officials about ways to resolve the Alan Gross and remaining Cuban five cases, opening the way for the U.S. and Cuba to take further steps toward normal relations. There are precedents in both countries for the release of foreign prisoners on humanitarian grounds and to advance other national interests. It is my hope that if you are able to speak to the Holy Father in the near future, you will convey the substance of this letter and suggest to him when he meets with President Obama on March the 27 to raise these cases and urge the President for humanitarian reasons and to advance the cause of reconciliation between the U.S. and Cuba to resolve them urgently. But Senator Leahy's letter was dated March 14, and it reached me two days later. It was clear that I not, had no planned trip to Rome in the little more than a week that separated us from the visit of President Obama to the Vatican. So I decided to send quickly to the, through the nunciatura, to the apostolic nunciatura, Senator Leahy's letter in English and Spanish to the Secretariat of State of the Holy See, so that Pope Francis had knowledge of its contents before the visit of President Obama. In my conversation with Pope Francis about a month after President Obama's visit to the Holy Father, I could see that this had happened. I had come to Rome on that occasion to attend the canonizations of St. John, Saint John the 23rd and St. John Paul II on April 27, 2014. At the end of the ceremony, the Secretary of State approached me to tell me that Pope Francis wanted to see me and told me in advance that Cuban authorities were asking the Holy Father for his involvement in a prisoner swap. I knew that the secret talks that were taking place between officials of the governments of Cuba and the United States were focused on the exchange of prisoners. Since some time ago, I had been visited by several U.S. officials who came to Cuba with the release of Alan Gross as an issue in their agenda. 
Among them were Senator Jeff Flake, who visited several times, and the President of the United States Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Donahue. These visitors always interviewed Alan Gross, and Senator Flake informed me that the prisoner's mood was good and he hoped that he could be released soon. I was not surprised, therefore, that the Cuban authorities had expressed to the Secretariat of State their desire that the Pope intervene in a prisoner swap. My interview with the Pope Francis was scheduled for May 5, 2014 at 2.10 p.m. in the Apostolic Palace. This day, the meeting took place. Pope Francis told me that when President Obama had visited him, he had expressed to the president the need to put an end to the economic sanctions against Cuba so outdated and harsh. President Obama agreed and pointed out the fact that these sanctions were enforced before he was born and that they did not depend on him but were rather in the hands of Congress. At the assistance of the Holy Father, President Obama said that there were obstacles to the improvement of the relations between the two countries, an American being incarcerated in Cuba and three Cubans in the United States. The Pope had understood during that friendly meeting with President Obama that taking into account the views expressed by Senator Leahy, something could be done to remove the obstacles the president has referred to. On the other hand, the Pope was being invited by the Cuban government to enter negotiations already underway that included a prisoner's exchange. When this issue was addressed, I told the Holy Father that it was aware since 2013 of the conversations that were taking place between Cuba and the United States on the release of prisoners. Since members of the U.S. government and others who were interested in, the, in this prisoner had visited me and informed me of the efforts being made. Some of those qualified visitors indicated referring to a trade. Hardliners in the USA, three for one, no way. From the above, it appeared that negotiations had reached a point where someone should take action to take them out of the stagnation caused by the obstacles mentioned by President Obama to the Holy Father, namely the prisoners held on both sides. It was necessary to unblock the negotiations. The beginning of the electoral campaign in the United States was approaching, and President Obama's term would end in 2016. Both negotiating teams were in a situation of emergency. In this context, the figure of Pope Francis, endorsed by the long tradition of the Church as a mediator in conflicts, and the very mission of the papacy to seek peace, emerged as someone with the moral authority to help advance this negotiating process, especially taking into account the personal talents of this Pope who has tirelessly endeavored to promote dialogue and facilitate encounters between people of different tendencies. This disposition of the Pope and the relevance of diplomacy to overcome conflicts were neatly explained by the substitute of the Secretary, Secretary of State, Archbishop Angelo Becciu, shortly after the agreement between Cuba and the United States was made public in an interview with TV 2000. Should we, uh, yes. should we maybe pause there and have Ambassador De Laurentiis say a few words from his uh, viewpoint, and then we can engage. I just am worried about, about time. Do you, do you uh, want to? Sure. Yeah. I think, uh, Your Eminence, I think you have a book there. Yes. Uh, uh, which, which will be uh, fantastic. I, I, I think what uh, His Eminence is, is providing is, um, is the real grist for 
how diplomacy uh, works. And so let me just throw out kind of six lessons and then we can uh, go back to hear how it all uh, unfolded. Number one, uh, diplomacy matters and it can really do uh, great things. So, as a diplomat, it sounds a little bit self-serving, but um, I think certainly in this case, it's true. The second is to be discreet, because everything that His Eminence is talking about uh, went on behind closed doors, uh, and it would not have been successful uh, had it been uh, public. The third is to enlist friends. Uh, we needed, the U.S. government needed an outside guarantor to the commitments uh, uh, that we were making and, and the Cubans did as well to build trust between, uh, between the parties. Fourth, I would say, is demonstrate courage, uh, which both leaders have done with the help of the Pope. Be patient, very, very important and probably the hardest to master. And think about the impact of the people you're serving. I'll stop there, and maybe you want to continue the... Uh... Right, and, and perhaps uh, I think what the audience would love to hear is where you were that at, at the end of the process. So what, where were you on that morning, and how did it all come about um, the, the, when the news broke? That, I think that would be really interesting. But go back to, to um, before that, if, you, if you'd like, Your Eminence. In this occasion, to the TV 2000, uh, as Bishop Bechu said, the Pope charmed the representatives of the Cuban and American people. It was them who asked the pontiff to be the guarantor of this desire for negotiation, dialogue, and encounter. They came here to the Secretariat of State to sign the two respective documents in the presence of the Secretary of State almost as a guarantor of the vows exchanged between them. Diplomatication, a word that goes beyond its traditional meaning, is understood here in the sense of a man and a leader who is committed to his word with his charisma to conquer the two heads of state so that they expressly ask the Pope to help them. The Pope did not balk at this. Later, he utilized the service of several people who could fulfill the desire for dialogue and encounter. End of quote. I was one of those people. That's, let's, should we pause there um, again? And I, I suppose that uh, what lessons do you think, um, either of you think that there are here in terms of the unique role the church played here? Can it play that role elsewhere? Well, I would, I would say two things. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Vatican, the, the Catholic Church has not decades, but centuries of experience at diplomacy. Yes. Um, they are uh, the best uh, diplomats on the planet, maybe because they're helped uh, by a higher uh, power. But, but, uh, but all kidding aside, uh, they, they are professionals, very experienced. And, and, and certainly in these kinds of negotiations, sometimes the two parties can't manage it on their own. And they need, uh, they need to enlist friends. Uh, and they need help both sides uh, can trust. And as both sides are making commitments that they hadn't made in 55 years in this case, uh, both sides needed uh, the church to be involved and to act as a guarantor and witness to these commitments because it gave trust to both sides that each side would uh, undertake the commitments it had made. But this was, in a way, a, a, a very different process for the U.S. because usually bilateral issues come first and then you reestablish relations. Here, that model was turned upside down and we reestablished relations before we worked on all these other bilateral issues. So can you comment on why that and has it worked? Well, I think for, for each, uh, each theme, each issue, uh, the model is, is different. 
it is true that in, in the case of China, we began discussions, and then I think it was 11, 12 years later where we finally um, uh, reestablished diplomatic relations. In this case, it made sense to do it earlier, although there were certainly, there were six months of negotiations between uh, December 17, 2014, and when we in fact did uh, reestablish uh, diplomatic relations in, in July of 2015. We had several issues to, um, uh, to negotiate, some, some difficult. Um, but both sides wanted uh, uh, to have negotiation, to have diplomatic relations early uh, uh, in order to uh, ensure that their embassies uh, uh, were effective and could do the kinds of things that they wanted. Uh, and, and also it was deemed to be helpful in moving the process uh, forward. Your Eminence, do you think the church has a, a still work that it can do to keep moving things forward? What's the next, the next? Um, In this relation yes, between yes. Cuba and the United yes, States? Yes, yes. Now, it, uh, it seems to me uh, it depends on both countries, directly, directly. It seems to me, uh, because the, the, the role of the chair was to put these two countries uh, uh, together, uh, resolving their problems between them, it seems to me. Right. Uh, I must con okay. in, in my conversation of May the, the 5, 2014, with Pope Francis, the Pope outlined in his brief remarks the way to go. From his words, I drew the following, because uh, the Pope considered that he should not act through a simple humanitarian intervention with the two governments regarding the prisoners in the respective countries, uh, acting ex officio through denunciatures. The Pope would not directly intervene in the negotiations to enslave prisoners. This corresponded to the two governments acting on agreement. The Pope accepted the suggestion of Senator Leahy to write letters to President Obama and Castro. But he would send these letters through a cardinal of the church who would take them to both presidents. For this purpose, he appointed me at the very moment of our conversation. The Holy Father was sending someone who would all, not only deliver the letters, but also explain by Mavoche the Pope's thinking. The Pope sucked a rapprochement between the two presidents so that they could talk and keep a dialogue between them. It was not only a dialogue between the two nations or governments. That's why I was not surprised when I came to know that both presidents had a long telephone conversation, more than half an hour, it seems, I, I don't know, two days before or one day before the announcement of the agreement on December 17. Eh? By that time, you were already in Havana, ambassador. So tell us what was going on at that point from your point of view in those last two days. Well, at that point, there were lots of uh, rumors flying around that something was afoot, that something was going to happen. I don't think anyone imagined that the two presidents would uh, announce that they were going to move to reestablish diplomatic uh -huh. relations. Yeah. But that maybe uh, finally Alan Gross would be able to come home, something. And um, the night before, ironically enough, which uh, was December 16th, we had a large uh, event at the American residence in Havana. It was a jazz festival of some kind. And frankly, only myself and, and maybe one other 
person knew what was going to happen tomorrow. And I remember standing in a in the corner looking out at all of these people that we were, of course, so happy to have at the residence, thinking to myself, I wish they'd all go home. Because, <laughs> uh, because I knew at 4 o'clock in the morning I had to get up and be taken out to the um, yeah. uh, airfield to, um, in a sense, uh, bring uh, have Alan Gross there to meet his family. And there was a, a plane that came uh, with a number of senators and, and uh, congressmen and his wife and lawyer and so forth. Uh, and we began, uh, we began this extraordinary uh, day. And by the way, within 10 minutes, CNN had the whole thing, so. Um, of course, of course, of course. And, and I, I guess the other piece that, that was unexpected was the invitation to Obama to come down to Cuba and the fact that we had this historic visit. I think no American president had set foot on Cuba since Calvin Coolidge. That's right. Um, and so it had been a long time. And, yes. and, and again, can you talk a little bit about how that developed from opening an embassy was one goal, but then the president visiting, and, and what impact do you think it's had? Well, I think it, it, it's all part of an effort to make this change irreversible. And he certainly made it very clear that he came to uh, sort of shatter the last remnant of the Cold War, uh, to extend the hand of friendship uh, to the Cuban people, uh, by the American people, and I think to uh, give a shot in the arm to the, all the negotiations and the process underway. Um, we, had, we had done quite a lot. We, we had uh, uh, reestablished relations. We had opened embassies. We started talking about a variety of issues where the two countries could cooperate. We started talking directly about all of the issues that we uh, had great differences. Uh, but it was, the visit was really a way to accelerate and push forward this, um, this process of, of reconciliation, but in a clear-eyed way, knowing that we have many, many issues um, where we disagree and uh, and we're trying to work through as we go forward. And can you talk about what some of those issues are that we're still trying to sort out and what, what, where we're making progress and not making progress? Well, we've, we've created a, uh, what we call a bilateral commission, uh, which manages uh, this whole process. We've signed memorandums of understanding in agriculture, in the environment, uh, law enforcement cooperation, um, a variety of other, uh, 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 of other issues. We're, we're trying to find uh, themes, issues, where two countries 90 miles apart uh, ought to be cooperating as a matter of course. Uh, we're, but we also have some challenges. One is in the field of, of human rights, where we have very different uh, interpretations of what that means. Another is uh, the whole issue of claims. Uh, and the third is uh, uh, fugitives from American justice who are living in Cuba. And we've uh, established a mechanism, a process, to address all of these things. Again, it goes back to the be patient uh, uh, um, lesson. Uh, these are going to take more time, but uh, we started the process, and we're determined to see it through. And Your Eminence, have you seen progress since December? 17th? Oh, yes, sure, yes. And, and, and what, where do you see the, the progress? Where do you see the biggest impact? Yeah, yes. Uh, 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 many Americans are visiting Cuba uh, under the categories uh, uh, established by the government of the uh, President Obama. Uh, there is uh, a, a, a new language, a, a, a good, a, a new, uh, the, the visit of President Obama was very well uh, accepted by the people. He, he, he was received in Havana with joy and uh, 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 very, yeah. it was a very good visit. Yes, uh, it seems to me uh, this way 
uh, is going to continue uh, positively, yes. Well, I think sadly we are out of time, but I want to uh, thank uh, both of you. I, and, I, have, I, I, I know, I know. I have not finished, but I know, I know that they're they're telling us we're done. But uh, <laughs> but I want to thank you, and we look forward to to sharing the rest of your. Um, we, we look forward to your book. Yeah. <laughs> we really do. Thank you.